Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Okay, welcome to today's lecture. 28 people are here. Okay, so let me start with some announcements. Uh, probably most of you already have seen, but uh, if not yet. So uh, your midterm grading result is available on ETL. So you can use the gradebook uh, function uh, in, the, in the ETL to check your total score as well as the uh, per question scores. And we uploaded the uh, solutions for your uh, midterm exam. So you can actually check uh, if your answer was correct or not uh, based on the solution. And please check um, your expected score and it, uh, it's actually matching to what uh, the score you actually got. So based on that, if you believe the grading has some error, uh, please contact the TAs to claim for the regrading. But um, for the sake of the TAs time, we strictly restrict uh, the um, claim only during this week. So you can use the, the TA office hour, Tuesday and Friday as usual. But if you have any conflicts on both of those dates, you can ask the TAs to schedule a separate meeting. But please uh, do that by this week. Uh, this is, we will be really strict about that. So after that, uh, even though there's any uh, issues in the grading, your score will not be edited. So uh, please keep that in mind. So check your score and the uh, solution and contact the TA if you think uh, there's any problem. And, um, yeah, one thing to notice that the claim is only for the correcting the grading errors, not negotiating or bargaining your scores. So check the solution and your score by, uh, the, score by the questions first and contact the TAs only if you believe that the grading was incorrectly done. Any questions about this? Yeah, this year, uh, uh, this semester, the average is 63.1, which was slightly higher than the previous semester, uh, even though I believe that the question was slightly harder, probably because I already gave you uh, last semester's questions on the midterm, and uh, you have already uh, known the types of the questions. Anyway, uh, did a good job, and if you are not satisfied with the score, you have another chance on the final exam. And also the project is really important for this class. So focus on your project. And if you have a good results, then yeah, you don't have to worry about your final grade. Okay, so that was the announcements. And as user, we are going to review the materials we have covered in the last lecture. Okay, uh, let's start with the simple question. Jisoo, Song Jisoo. Professor? Yeah. In the last lecture, we learned about metric learning. So what is a metric learning? Well, uh, metric learning is, uh, how shall I put it? Mm -hmm. Well, metric is a, a scalar which represents the vector or the image or video or anything. So, Matrix learning is uh, learning, <laughs> learning the matrix to convert the vector to scalar. <laughs> uh, actually not. Uh, yeah, I, I think you missed some important concept here. It's okay, uh, but yeah, it, it was a good try. Let, let me ask someone else uh, again. Mm, okay, please turn on your camera. I can't see your face. Wang Hee Hwan? Wang Hee Hwan? Hyun So, uh, it's okay for you to turn it off. <laughs> I, I see you're driving, so. Safety first. You can turn it off if you'd like to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hyuhan answered in the text. So, uh, yeah. What is the metric learning? Yeah. 
Yeah, think about it. And if though I didn't ask you, uh, all of you. Yeah, what is the matching learning? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Um, yeah, what is metric learning? Just in one sentence. Ivan, are you try, uh, typing something? Uh, Professor, did you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah I can hear you. Me? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I think metric learning, the main concept of metric learning is uh, it's um, hmm. some using some different meaning to calculate distance between the ground truth and some input. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually he answered the most important term, which is the distance. So before this metric learning, uh, all the things we have covered, like image classification or video classification or all the other stuff was mainly mapping the uh, instance, such as image or video, to some label directly. But in the last lecture, we talked about um, distance or similarity between two objects. So metric learning is a task of learning uh, a distance function or similarity function over objects. And we uh, use some known relationship between the examples to um, um, learn some model which maps some unseen examples, generalizes to uh, its pr uh, plausible location in the embedding space such that the examples are uh, preserved, uh, their um, rela uh, relationship or similarity or distance, right? Jisoo, uh, do you understand that? Great, yeah. OK, and uh, in the metric learning, we learned about two things. Uh, actually, one is the triplet learning, and the other is the contrastive learning, which we are going to cover today. So in the last lecture, we learned about triplet learning. So let me ask to explain about the triplet learning to uh, Song Hee. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what um, is a triplet learning? It was like there was anchor and negative and positive in triplet mm -hmm. learning, and uh, you should uh, we should. Um, compare the distance between anchor and negative and anchor and positive, and then keep some, uh, make some loss between that. Uh, um, yeah, and then yeah, you can you can just explain what that loss function is. Uh, it, the distance between anchor and positive, and minus the distance between anchor and negative, and then plus alpha, which is the margin, mm -hmm. isn't, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, what is the meaning of that? Why why do we do that? Uh, to find which is more more have the positive relevance with one picture between other picture, like between other scene, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah, actually, great, uh, great answer. Thanks, Songi. Um, so, yeah, we um, minimize some loss, that's exactly what Songi said. Uh, we have three um, examples in each triplet, anchor, positive and negative, and we would like to put 
the uh, positive closer to the anchor than to the negative. Sorry, uh, from anchor to positive should be closer than from the anchor to negative. And when we uh, mathematically express it, that's what exactly Sung Hee said. So uh, in that way, we can actually uh, put relevant examples together in some embedding space. And if they are not close to each other, uh, not relevant to each other, we just put uh, them far away. In that way, we can learn some embedding space, which preserves the uh, relative relationship between two examples. And actually, that can be generalized to unseen examples. So that is the triplet learning. And uh, great job, Sungi. Uh, and in the um, triplet learning, we talked about uh, some hard negative mining. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, let's talk about why we uh, have that um, issue and how can we solve that. So let me ask this to Yeji, Song Yeji. I can't hear you, sorry. You are muted. I just hear very small sound, but I can't hear your voice. Okay, it seems she has some technical problem. So uh, let me ask to someone else. Uh, okay, Jaewon, Kim Jaewon. Uh, hi, professor. Yes. So, uh, what is the semi-hard negative mining, and why do we need that? Okay, we need a uh, negative. Mi uh, firstly, we need negative mining because if uh, negative examples are ex extracted randomly. Uh, the loss function is approximately equal to zero, and uh, loss function is uh, equal, uh, approximately equal to zero, and model learns nothing. So we need uh, we need a uh, semi we, we need ne negative mining, and usually uh, we do negative mining by uh, randomly distribute first randomly distribute negative uh, examples and then uh, calculate a distance by KNN. Great. Uh, so yeah, he, his answer was perfect, um, as you heard. So uh, without semi-hard negative mining or negative mining, the, the loss function will goes to zero once we train uh, just few iterations because those random negative negatives are too easy and too different from the positive examples. So the model will be easily uh, find out that that's negative and already positive is already closer to the anchor than from the negative. So the loss will be exactly zero, uh, not approximately, but it's exactly zero. And then it learns nothing. So uh, what do we do? We have to put some hard negatives that the model is still not able to correctly locate the positive and negatives in the in the embedding space. So that's what we uh, do, the semi-hard negative mining for the triplet loss. And I would like to emphasize that that's really important. Uh, hard negative mining is the key to succeed triplet loss based learning. Otherwise, you're going to learn actually just a few things. Uh, and it, it will just converge, and it will not generalize well to the unseen test sets. If you're doing some projects uh, uh, using the triplet loss, then uh, negative mining would be really important and um, keep that in mind. And uh, yeah. And we also talked about uh, the issues with the semi hard negative mining because um, we require quite large batch size to uh, make it effective. Otherwise, if the mini batch size is too small, then uh, the model will not be able to find actually uh, hard uh, examples. And then it's basically uh, same as doing nothing. So, okay, uh, that was the 
the review for the last lecture. And OK, I see Hyunseo has arrived uh, in the lab. Great. OK. OK, so today we are going to learn um, the other type of um, um, metric learning, which is really widely used, uh, contrastive learning. So contrast is, uh, we, we say like by contrast. So we uh, put those two things set aside. And then um, uh, if, the, if they are different, then we just set aside and uh, vice versa. So that is the main idea of contrastive learning, which is very similar to the triple loss. So, uh, OK, let's see what's happening here. So contrastive learning actually has a long history. Um, you may see that this paper is, was written in like 2006, uh, like 15 years ago. So the pairwise loss function, uh, we um, are given an uh, input example, select like images. And the ground truth is given as uh, distance. So um, if they are similar, then the label is 0. And if they are dissimilar, then the label is 1. So I uh, emphasize here that's the distance. Because if you interpret this as a similarity, then that should be the opposite. But here they use the distance as the ground truth. So 0 is similar, and 1 is not similar. And for each case, they applied different loss functions, Ls for similar, loss, similar case, and Ld for dissimilar case. So uh, here, the, uh, the loss function is summing over all the examples, uh, and it, the loss function looks like this. So they apply Ls if y, the ground truth labor, is 0 which is the similar case. So if y is 0, then this term will disappear, because y is 0. And only this term will uh, survive, which is uh, ls, the loss function for the similar case. And if y is 1, then that means the ground truths, they are dissimilar. So we apply another loss function called ld here. So here, uh, dw is the distance function between the x1 and x2 computed by our model. So uh, yeah, DW is basically our model. So here's what they have done in their paper. So uh, as an, uh, this is just an ex uh, example. So you can actually design uh, another different uh, shape of functions. But basically, uh, it should be looked like this. For the loss function, for the similar case, uh, the ground truth is the similar, then we have to put higher loss when we uh, estimate the distance between those two are large, right? So the larger the gap between x1 and x2 is to, uh, to, the, uh, to the right side, this um, ls should increase like this. So they use this function, uh, just 1 over 2 multiplied by just the distance square. So uh, the loss function is basically the estimated distance squares. So if the distance is estimated as 0, then no loss, and it's uh, increasing, then um, quadratically increasing the, the, uh, the loss function, the loss value is. So they use this um, ls function when uh, the y is 0, which is the ground truth the same, uh, the, uh, similar. And the opposite case, if the ground truth says that they are irrelevant, then uh, they use this function, which is uh, looking like this. So it looks a little bit complicated, but actually that's the same. Uh, so this max means uh, it's like a, uh, how should I say that? So uh, below this margin, then uh, if the distance gets smaller, then the loss gets increasing according to this function. And if they are uh, different enough above uh, this m, beyond this m, then the loss becomes a zero. That's how they design this uh, function. So depending on the labor, they uh, apply these uh, two functions, either of them. Uh, and that's how they uh, introduce the contrastive learning for the first time. So basically, uh, what they do is just putting the similar examples get closer, and dissimilar examples get farther away from each other. So suppose they are mixing just the uh, images uh, of the handwritten digits, 9 and 4 here. And you see that 
Uh, nines are getting together by this loss, and fours are also getting together by the, the loss. And at the same time, nine and four should be set apart as much as possible. So by that loss, you see that the nines are uh, here, the blue region, and the fours are here in the red region. And you see that, interestingly, when they are uh, close to each other, in the border, around the borderline, some of them looks like either nine or either four. It's hard to tell, something like this. Or uh, in this case, the fours are clearly uh, shown, then uh, that's very far from this blue region and vice versa. So with this contrastive learning, you don't have to have the labels that this is nine, this is four, but you just say, uh, uh, we just have the data that uh, this image is same as this, this image is dissimilar to this. We just use that information to put uh, the similar things together and dissimilar things set apart. So that's the main idea of the contrastive learning, and this is an example. So uh, here, um, this is just a screenshot of their algorithm. So they collect some data set uh, using some prior knowledge. So this can be uh, in a variety of way, depending on the data set or the problem. But uh, for something like in, in the previous lecture, we uh, saw some example that um, we consider two videos uh, relevant to each other if they are co-watched by many users many times, something like that. We take advantage of some data like that. Here, I don't know, uh, we can just use the labels or usually in, in this contrast learning, we don't have the labels. So somehow they uh, use the similarity and the dissimilarity of uh, the annotations of these the pairs. So. If they, are, uh, they have some positive relationship, those are uh, considered as a positive example, and then they follow this red loss, LS. And if they are annotated as dissimilar or just randomly chosen, then they, uh, they are uh, following the other loss function. And uh, here they actually use the same loss function here. And um, if yij is zero, then uh, they would like to decrease it. And if it's uh, dissimilar cases, then they would like to increase this because they should be uh, far apart. So that was just a traditional example of the contrastive learning. And um, we are going to see some recent use case of this uh, contrastive learning. So uh, let me go back to our normalization problem, which we have learned in the very beginning of our lecture, which was the softmax classifier. So suppose we are doing some image or video classification. And at the very last layer, we usually output some unbounded scores for all the classes. And then we take the softmax function, which looks like this. So each of these scores, are uh, first we take the exponential of that. And sum over all of the scores, exponential of those scores, and divide by that. So uh, in this way, we uh, guarantee that the score sums to 1 and all of them are between zero and one. So that was how we output somewhat probability as the uh, estimated scores for each of those classes. So that was the softmax function and we just used that for all the classification functions so far and that was okay, it was working, great. But now suppose we have the classes, like uh, the number of classes is like millions or 10 millions or even more than that. For example, in Google uh, or YouTube, we classify the videos to more than a million classes. Some of them are really fine-grained classes. Some of them are really general classes, like just music video. It's, it's really, really high uh, number of classes uh, for the classification problem. So uh, suppose we minimize this cross-entropy directly as usual, then this is the, uh, the definition. And you may remember that um, all, uh, be, even though we are summing over all the uh, classes, still only one term will survive where uh, this yi is actually the correct class. All others will be just canceled because this part is zero. But still, this part, p of y is equal to ci given x, is this, which is this. So this function is actually depending on all the scores in the denominator. So if we compute the uh, gradients uh, using the gradient, uh, the back propagation, then the loss will depend on every output in the network, not just for that class. And then even though it's just automatic, still it needs to compute the gradients and its effect for all the possible classes. 
And then for every example, we have to uh, ha we will have some non-zero values of the gradients for all the classes, and we have to compute all the time for these million classes, which is a disaster, right? So the first idea was very simple. Let's do some negative sampling. So we have um, only one positive example for each classification example, uh, and then all others will be uh, negligible. If our trainer is somehow a little bit trained, then it will start to output uh, very low scores for incorrect classes. Only just a few will have some positive uh, quick, uh, notable values, and they will compete to each other. Uh, but most of them are already being zero very soon. So um, why should we update all of them? That would be like 10 to the minus 7, and we just update it to 10 to the minus 8. Should we really do that? So they just uh, suggested to just randomly sample some negatives. Of course, we have, uh, have to update the positive. But the negatives, we can just sample some, uh, some uh, just a small numbers um, randomly, and then just update that, because they will be almost 0 already. So this sounds really weird in mathematically, because we have to normalize uh, all of these cores, but we just randomly sample some of them. That doesn't sound like OK. But actually, once the uh, model uh, is somewhat trained, then uh, we may already have this, uh, most of these classes that probably will be almost 0. So this is the sentence that uh, I found uh, from some page that uh, which uh, just uh, talking about this situation. Should we really use and update the parameters for the word zebra for every training sentence? Which the zebra is a really rare word uh, in, in English. And we are just uh, updating uh, for every sentence, like uh, I'm talking about some machine learning. And the uh, zebra probability, we're just getting down and down again and again. Do we have to do that all the time? So that's just the motivation for this. And surprisingly, this was written by this famous person, Yosha Benjo, is uh, one of the three guys who kind of invented deep learning. And uh, he received the Turing Awards uh, like three years ago. Uh, so this idea is also really quite uh, old, like from 2003, uh, when I started my undergrad, uh, almost 20 years ago. So, so using this idea, but uh, although this idea was really uh, old, but still that is use, uh, actually used in most recent state-of-the-art uh, models like SIM uh, CLR. So this paper was published in uh, November last year, exactly one year ago, by Jeffrey Hinton. So this is the contrastive learning applied to image classification. And uh, there, uh, they actually use uh, the different data augmentation on the same image. Uh, and they uh, produce two uh, related images from just one uh, input image by applying different data augmentations. Now, suppose this is the original image. And then they apply data augmentation. Uh, we call that, uh, what, what was the data augmentation? We apply some change, slight change in the, in the image, but still the semantics of that image is uh, preserved. That was what we uh, apply to increase the amount of the training data, remember? So uh, they somehow um, chose some subset of this, uh, sub, sub part of this image here and another subpart here. So these two images are uh, showing the same thing, as we can see. But for computers, uh, the pixel-wise, they are completely different. So they use these two as, uh, uh, as the positive relationship. So they uh, train the model to put these two in the, uh, in the close place in the embedding space. That's what we basically train. Then what about the negatives? So uh, for negatives, they actually use the mini batch, very similar to the triplet learning. So suppose uh, they use the mini batch of size n, then they will have two n images because for each one image they created these two uh, a pair of images using uh, different data augmentations. So they have total two n images, and for each image there are only one positive. It's doppelganger with uh, partner, and all other two n minus two are different, just negatives. So they use 
this one as a positive and all others as negatives. And then they optimize the contrastive loss, which is this. So uh, here, the similarity between zi and zj should be high, which means they need to be close uh, to each other if they are the positive pair, which is the doppelganger originated from the same image. And all others, all the two n images, when k and i are different, then all of these are the negative examples. So denominator is not the entire data set, but they just use the mini batch, which is uh, something like this. Uh, not uh, everything, but they just uh, use the subsample of the entire data set, and they just use uh, only those to uh, normalize this similarity scores. So that is it, actually. This is very similar to um, this uh, softmax, but um, instead of using the entire classes, they just used a um, subset of them. And another uh, main idea of this paper was using uh, data augmentation uh, applied to the same image, and they are considered as a positive uh, relationship, and all others are negative. So uh, that's why uh, this method is self-supervised. We don't need to label that this is dog. We just apply different data augmentations like this, just cropping uh, some random places or uh, resizing the image or changing it to uh, uh, black and white or some distorting the color, jittering or the rotating and so on. Just they apply these things and then they used uh, where the C and G is from the same image. They are just positively related and all others are negative and just, they just, uh, optimize this loss function, and then boom, they have very nice representation of these dogs. And they were able to figure out that this is dog after the fine tuning. So that's the SimCLR. Um, and the last part of this lecture is the noise contrastive estimator, which is uh, slightly more challenging to understand. So uh, let's try to do it. So. Mm, NCE is also uh, widely used in uh, the metric learning. So this is more systematic approach for contrastive learning, uh, which was originally or, uh, applied to the word embedding in the natural language processing area. So uh, they wanted to um, predict the meaning of the words. So if two words are re uh, relevant to each other, they wanted to locate them, those embeddings at the same place otherwise in a far away. So basically that is uh, where suited to this uh, metric learning task. So uh, originally they tried to use the softmax classifier. So if they are close to each other, then the similarity should be high, otherwise it should be small. And um, that causes the exactly the same problem as we've seen. Uh, when the number of classes is too high, actually it, it is because there are like hundreds of thousands of English words so we have to update uh, all of them all the time. So they wanted to avoid that. So they kind of converted this softmax classification problem to a binary classification problem. So we are going to see how. So uh, they have the data set of uh, word pairs, which was extracted from the actual sentence or actual text corpus or the actual data set. So for example, I am a boy and there were, let's do some more complex examples like by learning to distinguish the true pairs, this is a, some English tense tense, then distinguish pairs. For example, those two words are related because we see those two words in the same sentence many times, suppose. So uh, those are uh, the positively related pairs and they also randomly chose um, two words from just fake pairs just randomly choose just two words from the dictionary. It's not related to any uh, sentence. So something like, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's a, just uh, randomly chosen two words as the fake pairs. And then the model is given two words and they, uh, the model is trained to figure it out if these two words are coming from a real sentence or just randomly chosen two words, pairs. And the model is just trained to classify it uh, in that way. So uh, suppose we have M training examples 
uh, which is labeled as x1 to xm. And uh, let's denote pm to be the probability distribution from which these examples are actually sampled. So these are the, uh, the distribution of the word pairs that actually, uh, uh, actually um, observed in the text, very large text corpus. So suppose you have uh, all, the, all, all the texts uh, in, the, uh, in the library and just count correlation between the two words uh, and just have that probability distribution. So something like that. So we, uh, we don't know what it is, but we would like to estimate what this is uh, probability R. And the, for the fake probability, we just use some uniform distribution, which is the easiest. So we just randomly sample n words, uh, n examples, uh, which is called y1 to yn. And we just mix all of them. And then we train our model to distinguish if each sample is coming from pm or pn. pm is the real distribution. pn is some fake distribution, such as uniform. So the real samples xi are to be classified as from the real target distribution. And the fake samples are to be classified as the fake distribution. This is a binary classification. So uh, we used logistic regression, which is one of the simplest uh, binary classifier. So let's see. Uh, this H is their classifier. So given XI, some example, uh, from the real distribution, they wanted to maximize its uh, score. So let's see. Uh, they wanted to maximize the score of this because uh, XI is actually coming from the real distribution. And they used the logistic regression, which is uh, here. So we didn't cover this logistic regression, but uh, probably most of you already learned about this in uh, basic machine learning courses. Uh, otherwise, where you can review the materials from machine learning courses, this is the logistic regression. Uh, and then this, uh, yeah, this is same as this. To make this large, then uh, this part should be large because uh, this is a negative, then the minus g will decrease, and then exponential of minus g will also decrease. And because this is the denominator, the entire will be increasing. So to make this h large, this g also output larger numbers. And then what is the g? g is the um, ratio of uh, the probability, uh, the real probability divided by the fake probability. So which means for the real examples xi, we need to uh, have the higher probability coming from the real probability than this fake probability. So this one should be large. So this, what, uh, what, it, what this is, the PM is the dis estimated uh, distribu uh, probability distribution of the real distribution, real world distribution. So uh, PM is modeled by our neural network and we have to output larger output for this particular example, XI. So for XI, we need to train it to output larger score because this is real. For this one, uh, should be smaller, but fake distribution is actually uh, not important because we just, just chose any fake distribution. So it doesn't really matter. So we don't need to update any uh, scores for this fake distribution. For this part, this is the fake example, YI. So for this one, we have to decrease its score as much as possible, opposite to this. So now, yeah, that's why we have the one minus this. So this is same as this. And then to make this smaller, this part should be smaller as well. And then this is same as this, right? To make this smaller, what should we do? This part should decrease, opposite to this. And what does that mean? For this fake word, our model should output smaller score because this is the fake word, fake data. And for this one, again, we don't have to do that uh, because this is based on the fake distribution. So in this way, um, what we, in a high level, what we uh, really do is just sampling some fake examples from some random fake distribution and maximize the score of the real examples 
which is happening here, our model outputs the uh, prob estimated probability of the PM. So we have to output larger score for these real examples. And uh, on the other hand, for the fake examples, our model should output smaller probability because that's just randomly chosen. So uh, to summarize, this is converting the softmax classification problem to binary classification. Um, and we are, uh, our model is learned to classify uh, if the data example is coming from the real distribution versus the fake distribution. Then during, uh, uh, while it was doing that, we expect that they learn uh, which examples are relevant to each other versus not. And they will learn something behind the scene. And that's why we are doing this. Okay, so this part was just a little bit hard, I know. Um, it's, it's hard to understand. I was like that too. So please uh, review the paper and um, try to review the material again if you are uh, not following. And this is okay. Uh, I mean, this is hard for everyone. So uh, don't be uh, discourage yourself. And okay, so this is the end of lecture 15 and we're going to start lecture 16 now. <laughs>